Well, <clears throat> you might be thinking, how could Escape from the Planet of the Apes possibly even exist? Charlton Heston blew up the world at the end of Beneath the Planet of the Apes. How could this possibly, <laughs> with any kind of, with any kind of plausibility in terms of his narrative, continue? Well, Arthur, producer Arthur P. Jacobs and 20th Century Fox wanted a sequel despite the fact that Beneath the Planet of the Apes was supposed to uh, end it all. So, writer Paul Den was then commissioned to write to write a script that kind of uh, that <laughs> tries to continue the series with other characters who supposedly escaped the the uh, Doomsday at the end of the last movie, and those characters. <clears throat> well, I'll get to that in a minute. The movie opens in the 1970s, okay, and. And uh, the, the humans see see that uh, that uh, Taylor's spaceship is returning. They go, but it turns out that the spaceship um, and the astronauts are apes. More specifically, Cornelius and Zira, two returning characters, as well as a new character named Doctor Milo, um, who is an ape who apparently salvaged and repaired Taylor's ship. In the climax, during the climax of the previous movie, and that's how they escaped. That's how they escaped the Earth being destroyed. Is they, is they, um, is they got Taylor's spaceship working and went back in time to, to Taylor's own time. This raises a whole lot of questions, but you know I'll get to that. So, <clears throat> although they are initially reluctant to reveal that they are that they are hyper intelligent apes. Um, Cornelius and Zira eventually, after Dr. Milo is unfortunately killed by, by a uh, primitive gorilla, they eventually reveal that their true nature, and not only are they showered with questions and attention, but they are also showered with popularity. They become, they become these kind of celebrities. However, however, upon, upon the humans' uncertainty about their own future and what this means for their race, and 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 their role as the dominant species on Earth, the ground starts to sink beneath Cornelius and Zira's feet, and and they soon have to escape from those on Earth who would harm them. It's kind of a role reversal of of the first movie. Now, by all accounts, I should hate this movie. Because it's continuing a series of movies that you could argue should not really have been a series in the first place. Um, especially given the previous movie, the, poor, the uh, poor quality of the previous movie. And you are continuing it after what was supposed to be a definitive end for the series in the, in the previous movie. You know, how, how could they possibly continue it after the Earth blowing up? And their explanation here kind of shows that this movie was never originally meant to be to exist, but it does. And another reason I would I should hate it is because it kind of some of it is kind of a comedy. In fact, a large chunk of it is a comedy. I mean, there are there are several scenes that are played for laughs when when Zira and Cornelius are trying to integrate and adapt to to 1970s human culture. So, just based on those two things two two aspects alone, I should hate this movie, but I don't. I actually kind of like it. It's one of the better Planet of the Apes movies, honestly. It's one it's definitely one of the most self-aware of the series. I mean, throughout this whole movie, there is just this real recurring element of self-awareness. Especially during the comedy scenes. I mean, the comedy scenes are not poking fun. They're just... They're just kind of self-aware. They're... It's self-aware comedy from people who really believe and who, who are really taking this seriously. So, the performances. Well, 
I can't really complain about Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter at this point. I mean, they they completely fit perfectly into these roles um, as as Cornelius and Zira. I mean, to criticize them now would be to would be to <laughs> would be grasping at straws, in my opinion. I mean, they are just. I can't imagine anyone else playing these characters. Um, they are just so perfect in these roles, and the fact that these these two who, who originated as supporting characters have now essentially stolen the series from Charlton Heston, the leading character in the first movie, really shows really shows the, uh, the undeniable talent of these two actors and the chemistry that they share on screen and the fact that they are, again, able to work so well through this through this uh, through these ape masks so they're still really good and uh, who else is in this movie Bradford Dillman and Natalie Trundy play two scientists who who uh, end up helping Cornelius and Zero when they when they really don't know who to trust and as fellow scientists you do get the sense that they understand where where Cornelius and Zira are coming from in in that they don't really want to reveal what it exactly they did to humans in their own time. Um, because that's I mean, the macabre nature of that might not win them many new friends. Um, and again the reason that's that uh, that Bradford Dillman and Natalie Trundy are or and Natalie Trundy are able to are a little more sympathetic to this is because they themselves are scientists and they do the same things to apes or at least similar practices to apes so so there's that kind of subtle kindred spirit elements that's that really lends a lot of believability to what eventually grows into a very believable friendship between between these two couples um let's see who else Eric Braden is in this movie as uh, Dr. Hasline, who is the, the bad guy. Although, it, his motivations here are a lot more understandable than those of, say, General Ursus in the last movie. Um, because Dr. Hasline is looking out for the safety of the human race. I mean, he is trying to preserve, preserve not only man's dominance um, as, as, uh, as life forms, but also he's trying to preserve their... their the lives of everyone involved. I mean, he, I mean, his his dogged pursuit of the truth from from Cornelius and Zira doesn't really feel all that villainous. It just feels like he is trying to to uh, save the human race, and that's not to say that you're rooting against Cornelius and Zira. You just get the sense that this guy really wants to really wants the humans to survive, and he's really w willing to go to extreme, even murderous lengths. To, to ensure that, to ensure the human's survival and to prevent the eventual destruction of Earth that's, that he learns about later in the movie. So he's very good. He, he has a surprising amount of, uh, of understandability. <clears throat> Let's see who else. And two minor players, two people who are not really in the movie that much, actually leave a lot actually leave a much larger impact than I was expecting. Sal Minio as as Dr. Milo, the ape who accompanies Cornelius and Zero when they get here, he's very memorable and and I actually wish he was in more of the movie and I really wish that they hadn't just pulled him out of nowhere because he, he is nowhere to be found in the previous two movies. I mean, they literally just say, oh yeah, we know this guy who we we know this this fellow chimp who who has studied humans and got Taylor's ship working. We never saw any evidence of this in the previous two movies. We never see him. We never see them recover the ship. Um, but you know, Doctor Milo, he's. I mean, he's he's very much the voice of reason in the beginning of the movie. He's the voice of caution, and and you can tell that that uh, his his attitude influences Cornelius and Zero throughout the movie. Um, but but again, he's likable enough in his like five minutes of screen time to where to where again I really wish he was in more of the movie. And it's the same with with Ricardo Montalban at at the end of the movie. He plays uh, Armando, this this circus owner who 
who uh, shelters Cornelius and Zero toward the end. So, so he's very likable. He's it's Ricardo Montalban. I mean, the guy just oozes charisma, and and the fact that they are able to to again lend a lot of likability to a character who who they do just kind of pull out of nowhere is is pretty impressive and I think a lot of that has to do with the strong performances of Sal Mineo and Ricardo Montalban. So so yeah, those two are really good. There's not not really any wrong anything wrong with the acting. But what I really like about this movie is is the role reversal in regards to in regards to the the two main characters, Cornelius and Zero being in essentially the same position as <clears throat> as Taylor in the first movie, and to a lesser extent, uh, Brent in the second movie. Although, they do do something new with it. They do... This is not a... This is by no means just a carbon copy, just with the roles reversed. They do touch on the fact that Cornelius and Zira know the future of humans. They know... They do... They do have these very intelligent conversations about... about, you know, what happens to the humans, what were you? What exactly did you do? Where do humans stand on the on the evolutionary scale in the future? Um, <clears throat> and there are, and again, this kind of this kind of lends much more more believability to the villain, the villain, Doctor Hasline, because he because you really get the sense that he is very driven to to stop the destruction of Earth. Um, <clears throat> and and a lot of a lot of this movie's enjoyment comes from from uh, Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter kind of kind of talking to each other, discussing and discussing to the few um, to the few people they can trust about you know how much do we reveal about our origin, how much do we reveal about our true intelligence? Do we tell them that we knew Taylor? Um, what do we tell them about? about what we did to humans at the in our time. Do we tell them about the destruction of Earth? Blah 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 blah. Seeing them work these things out really adds adds a adds an element of suspense to this movie that I don't think was present in the other movies. I mean yeah the other movies had had shock value, obviously, but I don't really think there was any kind of uh, I don't really think there was much in the way of of, you know, what all do I tell these people? Because Taylor, in the first movie, he basically told them everything he, he knew. They just didn't believe him. Um, here, here, Cornelius and Zira, the humans don't really have any reason not to believe anything they say, because, because they're talking apes, and they came here in Taylor's spaceship. I mean, if the humans see that with their own eyes, I can't really imagine them saying, oh, that's too outlandish. I don't believe you. So, so it's really not a question of will these humans believe us. It's a question of of should we tell them this? Will this compromise our safety? So, so yeah, that's that's what really causes this movie to to be as interesting as it is. And and even the comedy, like uh, like Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter. As well as the supporting characters handle the comedy pretty well. I mean, I mean, some of the best stuff comes when they are doing these cognitive tests on, on the on the main characters. The humans are doing cognitive tests on the main characters to see to kind of gauge their intelligence. Um, like they hang a banana from the ceiling, and and they put these blocks in front of Zira, and Zira, without any trouble, just puts the blocks into stairs, climbs to the top of the stairs within reach of the banana, and just kind of sits there. And so the two scientists are like, why doesn't she take it? And Zira just says, because I loathe bananas. <laughs> so, really, really funny, genuinely funny moments like that. That, that's again, don't come at the expense of the characters, and don't come at, at the expense of of the tone of the movie. This is this is in keeping with the tone of the movie. It's just, it's just the situational. It's just it's just comedy entirely based on the situation, and it's comedy entirely based on these characters. And as long as none none of it feels forced, 
really the only time when it does feel like it's kind of going too far, and this is actually one of my minor issues with it, with the movie, is when they're doing this montage of Cornelius and Zira, you know, trying on human clothes, going around on a tour of the city. It That, I think, goes a little bit too far. Again, it doesn't kill the movie, in my opinion, because there still is... You can tell that that the actors are having fun. You can tell, like, there, there still is... It's meant to be ridiculous. So, so there's that, but again, I think they just go a little bit too far, and and it actually contributes to what I think is one of the one of the major drawbacks to the movie is that I don't really think it's entirely consistent in tone. For the most, for the first half and the second half of the movie, it's it's a pretty consistent tone. But around the halfway point, you know, when they're doing the montage and it's supposed to be really funny, I think I think the movie gets a little bit too lighthearted in in relation to how the rest of it is this very kind of again suspenseful suspenseful tone so so that's really one of my minor issues with the movie and again there are other issues with the movie you know why why didn't characters like milo and armando get more screen time but <clears throat> but again again i can't really complain i can't really complain all that much it's it's a solid entry in the series and you know, the role reversal is is handled very well. The acting is is predictably solid. <clears throat> and and yeah, really the only the only examples I can point to that further detract from the movie is the fact that some of it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Because again again they provide this very flimsy excuse or this, this very flimsy explanation as to how Cornelius and Zira got off the Planet of the Apes in the first place. Which is... Which... Again, they... They say that them and Dr. Milo, again, Dr. Milo, who is a character we've never seen before, he's... They... They went all the way out... They, they made this... This, uh... Journey which, if I recall in the first movie, took a few days, or at least took a long time, more more time than the climax of the previous movie took, they they made it all the way out there to, to the middle of nowhere, and... <clears throat> and they somehow, don't ask me how, they somehow got Taylor's spaceship out of the... out of the water, repaired it to where to where it was fully functional again or at least functional enough to to uh, at least functional enough for liftoff and they were able to replicate replicate the tra trajectory and everything to where to where they they went back in time to Taylor's to, to Taylor's time period Again, you can definitely tell that this movie was originally not meant to be. They really had to had to scrape from the bottom of the barrel in terms of plausibility here. As long as you can look past that, and as long as you can you can ignore or at least tolerate some of the some of the goofier moments and some of the tonal inconsistencies, I think you will find plenty to like it in this one. It's suitably different from the previous movies, which again was a problem I had with Beneath the Planet of the Apes. And oddly enough, it made me actually excited to see another Planet of the Apes movie. I mean, this is a series that, again, I didn't really feel originally should have been a series. The first movie was just, did just set such a high bar, and the follow up, in my opinion, was just so lackluster that I didn't really want to see another one. But, but, uh, Escape from the Planet of the Apes made me want to see another one. I mean, it laid this groundwork for this for this kind of ape uprising, which, in hindsight, kind of contrasts with with uh, with some of the some of the lore that was set up in the previous movies. But but you know, again, that's just a, another minor flaw. I mean, there are there are a few continuity errors here, and there are there are a little those get a little confusing. But you know. 
you know, the movie is satisfying enough, and and it keeps your interest. And that's that's really the biggest thing is that Beneath the Planet of the Apes did not really keep my interest all that much because it was just kind of the same thing. Here, it's a role reversal, sure, um, and you would think that they're just using this tired fish out of water premise, but they do enough things new with it that are that make it interesting and appropriately tragic when when everything culminates in the climax. So, yeah, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, a surprisingly good entry in the series.